Okay, you guys, so let's get on, get started with this. All right, so just a little reminder or whatever we want to call it. Um, this is my last lecture, so um, I'm pretty excited, kind of. I mean, I'm also kind of sad, but yeah, this is like my last lecture at Mount Sac ever. So hopefully it all works out, you know. Uh, no more lectures after this. We've got a quiz and then a test and a review session, and that's it, okay? So hope you guys had a, like a good semester. And just so like we end happy and stuff, I brought you guys some lobster. So uh, you guys can pass it around and there should be enough for one piece per person, okay? So don't take too many, all right? Okay, so we'll start on this side. Okay. Oh yeah, I was surprised that you figured that out. Okay, so yeah, it was, it's the California spiny lobster. I caught it a couple months ago and it's good, so enjoy. Okay, all right, so let's get started with this. We ended off our last lecture talking about um, the consideration for whether it's possible for sea urchins to be good or not, right? In the kelp forest ecosystem, were sea urchins good? No, right, because they're the ones eating all the kelp, okay? But that's a matter of perspective, because remember, kelp is what the whole kelp forest ecosystem is built off of. In this case, we might see an alternative example in which the algae or the kelp might not be so good, right? And then the role of sea urchins changes in this case. Okay, so let's get into this. For this, we had to talk about the other reef ecosystem, the coral reef, okay? So let's take a look at this. This is a coral reef. Um, can we verify that this is a reef, first of all? What's a reef? It's rocky. It's got holes for fish to hide and nest in, right? Okay, so that's a coral reef, all right? Um, is this stuff rocky? Yeah, okay, because you guys know what this is made out of, right? What's it made out of? Calcium carbonate, right? It's calcareous. This is a bunch of different types of corals, right? Um, they are made of calcium carbonate, which is basically a seashell, and hopefully you guys remember the phylum is cnidaria. That said, what's their class? Anthozoa, okay, good, all right, class Anthozoa. Um, does anybody recognize any of these types of corals? Yeah, brain coral. Brain coral, good, that was the most obvious one. Okay, so anyways, corals, right? These guys are Anthozoans, okay? They are cnidarians. That means that they all have stinging cells, right? Believe it or not, these things sting you. Um, they're made of calcium carbonate. It's really jagged and abrasive. If you've ever seen one of these and like they look cool and all, but when you touch them, they're hard and they scrape you, right? So if you end up brushing up against one, it will cut your skin. Like, it's, it's kind of crazy. It really cuts your skin easily, and then while it cuts your skin, it stings you with all of its polyps, and then you're like itchy for a week, right? So corals, right? You don't want to get too close to them, right? And also, um, if you do touch them, it also damages them as well. So. Okay, so anyways, corals, right? Corals made of coral reefs. We know that coral reefs is the anthozoan, it's a cnidarian, it's stinging cells, and it's made of calcareous skeleton. Okay, but not all of them are made of calcareous skeleton, only these ones, hard corals. See, there's actually another type of coral called soft coral. And soft corals are not made of calcium carbonate, and they are, you know, they're kind of squishy, they're flexible. They also live in an entirely different ecosystem. Judging from that picture, where do you think the soft corals live? Can we figure it out? What type of ecosystem do they live in? <coughs> not the deep sea. The not the epipelagic. It's not pelagic because there's a substrate. There's no substrate in the epipelagic. Right. Where do they live? Can you guys tell? They live in the kelp forest. Don't, don't you guys see that? Unless you're giving it away, what is that? You guys all forgot. It's literally the state fish. <laughs> it's called a Garibaldi, okay? So it's a pretty obvious Garibaldi right there, which shows that it lives in the kelp forest, right? Or maybe you can see the kelp in the background. But soft corals versus hard corals, right? Let's take a look at soft corals first. If we look at soft corals, it turns out they don't live in the tropical warm water where all the hard corals live, and it turns out their lifestyle is different too. 
Okay, so if we look up close, we see on all these like fingers, right, that they all have these white spots. All those white things, those are polyps. Okay, remember the polyp, it's, it's kind of like a sea anemone or it's like a jellyfish that's upside down and attached to the ground, right? These polyps, they sting, okay, and they're actually visible, which means that they're big. If they're big, then that means they're actually usable. Okay, so what I mean by they're usable is the way that the sea fan or the soft coral gets its food is using its polyps. So how do you use your polyps to catch food? Basically, but not filter because it's not a net. What, what's the other term I'm looking for? Suspension. Suspension. Remember how sea anemones get their food? Suspension fingers. So it turns out soft corals use their polyps to do suspension feeding on the plankton. Sound good? All right. So they eat plankton, okay? Soft corals eat plankton, um, but that's also partly due to the fact that there is plankton available, right? I'll get in more into that when we talk about the hard corals. Okay, so this is just a little tidbit on soft corals. Hopefully that makes sense, right? Now in contrast, look, these are the hard corals, right? Can you guys see the polyps on these guys? You can't, it just looks like the rocky structure. Right, you don't see the polyps, they're small and reduced. What type of polyps do they have? Vestigial polyps. So do you think that they use their polyps to do suspension feeding then? No, remember, vestigial means they are no longer used, right? These polyps are small, reduced, they don't use their polyps. So if they don't use their polyps, what do they eat, right? That's, that's the question here. Um, why don't they use their polyps, right? Well, first of all, tropical water tends to be oligotrophic. What does that mean? No nutrients. Okay, no nutrients means no plankton, right? So if there's no plankton in the water, do you guys see um, why suspension feeding would be a bad idea? Okay, and conse consequently, you go swimming around in the tropical water, and you're like, the water here is always so clear, like in Mexico, right? But over here, it's murky. The number one cause of murky water is plankton. Phytoplankton it makes the water look green. Right? Another common problem is like when there's a lot of waves and it kicks up a lot of sediment. Right? But otherwise, one of the most common reasons why water is murky is due to amount of phytoplankton in the water. And since there's not that much in the tropical areas, tropical areas that are oligotrophic tend to be very, very clear. Okay? So let's consider a few things. No plankton, so no suspension feeding. Water is very clear because there's no plankton. How can we utilize really clear water, okay? Clear water is very, has high visibility, okay? Because light can shine through it very well. Maybe you won't believe me, but it turns out corals don't eat by suspension feeding, they eat by doing photosynthesis, right? This is kind of strange because a coral is an animal, right? Here's an example of an animal doing photosynthesis. Wow, that's, how does it do that, right? Animals don't do photosynthesis. They don't have chloroplasts in their cells, right? So here's how it does it. The coral actually is not an organism living by itself. There's an organism living inside of it. Do you guys remember this picture from way back? This is probably from our second Here's a coral polyp. What are these green things? Do we remember what those were? Those were dinoflagellates. You guys remember? What's a dinoflagellate? It's a type of protist that. What's a dinoflagellate? You guys gotta know this by now. I'm gonna put it on the test. Dinoflagellate is a phytoplankton. Right? You guys should know this because diatoms and dinoflagellates, those are, those are the two main protein phytoplankton that I mentioned, right? So a dinoflagellate can do photosynthesis, right? You get a bunch of dinoflagellates living inside of you, doing photosynthesis. What does this remind you of? We just talked about it a couple of days ago. What does this remind you of? Who else does? Worm? Yeah, the tube worm, exactly. At the hydrothermal vent. Remember what happened over there? 
tube rooms and clams at the hydrothermal vents had bacteria living inside doing chemosynthesis. Here's a coral with dinoflagellates living inside doing photosynthesis for them. So the same kind of exchange occurs, right? These dinoflagellates, right, they provide food for the coral, and in return, the coral provides what? Shelter for the dinoflagellates. Okay? So they have this symbiotic relationship, right? Um, symbiotic relationship in which they both benefit, right? It's called a mutualism. There's a bunch of different types of symbiotic relationships out there, and you know, sometimes one of them benefits the other at the cost of the other, right? Sometimes one of them benefits and the other doesn't care, and sometimes they both benefit, right? This is one in which they both benefit. It's called a mutualism. And we also talked about one in which they both suffer. You guys remember what that one's called? Competition. Yeah, competition is a mutualism in which they both suffer. Um, predation and parasitism is one, and one benefits, the other one doesn't. And the last one's called a commensalism, but we don't have to go there. But anyways, you see that turns out because they have vestigial polyps, they can't suspension feed anyways because there's not that many plankton, they actually do photosynthesis instead. And they do photosynthesis with the help of the zooxanthellae, sorry, the dinoflagellates living inside of them. Those dinoflagellates are called zooxanthellae. Okay, it's, a, it's quite a mouthful and it's hard to spell, and, but remember, as long as you can spell it the right way it sounds, then you're good. Okay, so you guys should all practice this with me right now. Zuzantheli. Zuzantheli, okay? Make sure you guys got that down. That is a type of dinoflagellate that lives inside of coral. Okay? All right, so coral, they do photosynthesis with the help of the zuzantheli, right? So with that said, does it make sense that corals need clear water then? Right? Why do they need clear water? To get the sunlight, exactly, to do photosynthesis. If they don't have the clear water, then they won't be able to get to the sun, and they won't be able to do their photosynthesis, and that is bad, right? So with that said, it turns out, since these guys need sun, macroalgae that also need sun competes with the coral for sunlight, all right? So here we have a coral reef in which we have some corals here. They're trying to get the sun, but we also have algae growing here, also trying to get the sun, okay? Now, what type of organisms are coral and algae? They are both, what, what do they both do? They're lifestyle. They're both sessile, exactly. And sessile organisms compete for space. Who wins in sessile spatial competition? The one that grows is the fastest, right? Because remember, sessile creatures can't move, but they can grow, right? So whoever grows faster is gonna win. Who do you think grows faster? The macroalgae. The macroalgae. Algae grows really, really fast. Coral is very, very slow, okay? Thousands of years to build a coral reef where, because you have to build that skeleton, okay? Whereas the algae, they just grow their cells and that's it, right? Algae grows very fast and corals grow very slowly, so if the algae grows so fast, then that's, that's too bad, right? They're gonna smother all of the corals underneath, okay? So thankfully, to prevent all this algae from growing on top, we have a whole bunch of reef fish, okay? These are some classic examples of reef fish. They're all different types of surgeon fish, right? They're known for their uh, scalpel-like tail, but also they have these tiny mouths which are good for picking algae, okay? That's what they do. They just go around the whole reef picking algae off of the coral. You guys see how that helps, right? It's a niche, right? There's algae living on, on top of the coral and these surgeon fish are going for that algae and it just so happens that it benefits the coral by cleaning the algae off, right? They're not help, trying to help the, the coral, it's just that there's free food, right? So they go do that. So yeah, these are all different types of surgeon fish, right? This one's called the yellow tang, sailfin tang. I think this is called a yellow fin surgeon fish, and this is dory, right? Regal blue tang. So these guys, they like to eat algae, but guess what? They're also pretty, and humans like these too, right? Why do humans like these? For the tropical fish aquarium trade, right? And there's a lot of poaching that goes on. So 
let's just say we overfish all of these reef fish because they make those big bucks, right? We overfish them, what happens? The algae begins to grow unchecked by the fish population. What is that called? Prey release, exactly. In this case, the algae experiences a prey release and no longer being controlled by those reef fish, they overtake the coral because they grow faster than it and now they smother and shade the coral. Right? They compete for the space stronger and if the algae grows on top, then the coral cannot get the sunlight. The coral needs the sunlight to do photosynthesis. Right? Okay, so as you guys can see, overfishing of these reef fish has led to algal overgrowth on this coral reef and it's very bad for them. Okay? So there you go. This leads us into starting from a lush coral reef with a lot of fish and a lot of biodiversity to a coral reef that doesn't have that many fish and instead has mostly algae. What is this called? You guys remember? What is this scenario called? When you go from good to bad like that. We change the dominant organism. The biodiversity has been lost. Yeah, it's called a regime shift. Remember the previous example of a regime shift that I gave you guys was the kelp forest turning into urchin barren. In this case, we have a nice coral reef with reef fish turning into uh, algae covered coral reef. Right? This would be another example of such a regime shift. Okay? And it is the result of overfishing. Okay? So at this point, people are like, man, we have a big algae problem on these coral reefs. How do we get rid of all this algae? One popular way is to bring in another organism that likes to eat algae. Okay, but you want it to be a native organism, okay? You don't want it to be from somewhere else. So can you guys think of any other organism that's not a reef fish that likes to eat algae? Sure. Not the crab, but it's, it's the sea urchin. Remember the sea urchin? We were talking about how they love grazing. The sea urchin, right? It's a collector's urchin in Hawaii. All right, these guys eat algae and scientists are trying to bring in a lot of these guys to eat the algae off of the coral, right? And if they can eat the algae off of the coral, then good, right? We have an example of surgeons helping the ecosystem because algae is bad in this case, right? So you look at the kelp forest. The base of the whole ecosystem is kelp. So surgeons are bad. But over here, the base of the whole ecosystem is that coral. So algae is bad and sturgeons are good. Does that make sense? Right. So this is an alternative way to look at sturgeon, right? <clears throat> so you just eat the algae, and in that way, they kind of clean off all of the algae so that the coral reef can survive. Right? If the coral reef manages to survive because the sturgeons can eat all the algae instead of the reef fish, what is this an example of? What is this an example of? If the surgeons can eat off all the algae instead of the reef fish. Anyone remember? We talked about this yesterday. Yes, it is called redundancy, right? Remember, redundancy is the scenario in which you have multiple organisms taking the same niche. Okay, so in this case, what's the niche? Eating algae, right? Eating algae off of the coral. And we have multiple things. We have different reef fish, and we also have sea urchins doing this. So if we get rid of one, hopefully the other one can pick up the slack, all right? Yesterday, when we talked about redundancy, it was regarding eating sea urchins, right? And in the northern areas, we did not have as much redundancy, so we, instead we had a keystone species, the sea otter. But in the Southern California, we did have a lot of redundancy. Horned sharks, kelp crabs, um, sheep heads, and also spiny lobsters all ate sea urchins, right? <clears throat> okay, so this is a pretty helpful uh, example of redundancy, right? But still, maybe there's not enough sea urchins to eat off all the algae, right? Probably the fish are better at doing so. Okay, so that leads us into talking about anthropogenic 
impacts on the coral reef, number one, overfishing, right? When you overfish reef fish, it'll cause algal overgrowth and the corals underneath will not be able to get sunlight, okay? So let's write this down on the board because we're going to talk about five anthropogenic impacts and negative effects to biodiversity. Okay, and this is the first one that we mentioned, overfishing. Okay, you can keep adding to this list as we go through the rest of the lecture. Okay, so if you guys didn't realize already, anthropogenic means caused by humans. Notice it doesn't say arthropogenic because arthro means joint and anthro means human. So I'm gonna take off a lot of points if your guys are going anthropoda on me in the final, okay? No anthropods, it's an arthropod. Okay, anthropogenic impacts on coral reefs, right? Overfishing. There's a lot of different problems about overfishing, right? But we are gonna talk about those that are affecting reefs, okay? In the context of coral reefs, we're gonna mention all the five different anthropogenic impacts. And reefs is a really convenient ecosystem to talk about this because they're just so, they're so delicate, right? They're easily affected, they're not very robust. And all the little things that we do add up and really damage the reefs. Okay, there may be some other hardy ecosystems in which it wouldn't be so easy to explain these concepts. Right, so we're gonna talk about the cool reefs. <clears throat> okay, so, Let's continue on, right? Overfishing, we've seen a problem yesterday about it. Overfishing salmon causes kilowatts to switch their diet. Over here, overfishing and reef fish causes prey release on algae. Okay, so now consider the fact that this algae is, you know, growing in great abundance due to the fact that we are losing the predators, the reef fish. What happens now if this algae were instead in algae from a different place. Now that would be that, right? So let's talk about that. Invasive species. Have you guys heard of an invasive species before? It's an organism that is not supposed to be wherever you found it. Okay? So does anybody know any examples? What was that? Lionfish. lionfish. Yeah, the lionfish is a really big invasive species in the Caribbean, right? Um, what do they do? What do lionfish do? Do you know? Um, they eat other fish, the native species. But like, how do they eat them? They overhunt. They eat the babies. Okay, and they eat a lot. Okay, and then it really quickly decimates the population of the native fish. Okay, so that's a good one, lionfish, right? Does anybody know any more? Give you guys some examples. Um, rats. That's probably the worst one on earth. Okay, they carry disease and they're literally, wherever there are ships, there will be rats. And then it goes all over the place. And they eat a lot too. Um, there's a, something called the zebra mussel, right? The zebra mussel found in the Great Lakes and stuff. And it's a big problem because they like to grow on the bottom of boats and you have to clean them off. And they also grow inside of pipes like that we use and stuff. And that's bad as well. Um, what else? There's um, Louisiana red swamp crayfish, right? People intentionally spread this around because they want to harvest it to make money. And unfortunately, it damages riverbanks and also it uh, eats a lot of native fish and stuff. Right? You can think of a couple more. Uh, brown tree snake. Okay, the brown tree snake arrived on Guam by airplane. So that's where they got the whole idea of snakes on a plane, right? And then when you bring a snake to an island that has never seen a snake before, None of those birds on Guam can fly, so what do you think happens? Right? It eats them all, right? All the, most of the birds on remote islands have lost their ability to fly because they don't have any predators, and they're easy to get rid of. So for example, on Hawaii, one of the worst invasive species is the domestic cat, right? If there's hundreds of cats on the streets of Hawaii, have you guys seen them before? And people feed them too, because they feel bad. But you know what they do? All they do is catch native birds 
and now all the native birds are going extinct because of cats. But people love cats, so we don't care, right? So it's kind of sad. Okay, so anyways, invasive species, right? Species that are not supposed to be there. Let's consider what would happen if we had an algae that were invasive, right? How would that affect the coral reef, right? In this case, we had to think about the strength of an invasive species. Invasive species are in general very, very strong, right? And why is that? Because an invasive species is not supposed to be there. This is not a true figure, but just assume that whenever someone travels to a foreign area, they don't know what's going on, okay? So when a, a, a potential invader is going into a new ecosystem, he probably doesn't know what's going, going on, okay? So let's just assume that 99% of the time, an invasive species fails because he doesn't know understand the new ecosystem, okay? So let's just consider that, right? 99% of the time, it fails, right? Whereas 1% of the time, invades, okay? Now let's consider the other, from the other side. The native organisms seeing the invader come in, same problem applies. 99% of the time, the, the native population does not understand the invader, right? It works both ways, okay? So in this case, the 1% that does make it, 99% of the time, natives don't know how to deal with it, okay? And 1% of the time, the natives win, okay? So it works both ways. In, the invaders are unlikely to invade, and the native population is unlikely to defend, all right? Because they, neither side understand each other, right? So when an invader actually invades successfully, what's gonna happen? Which one's gonna happen? The natives don't know what to do, and that is bad. That shows you how strong an invasive species is, right? Out of the 99% that failed, the 1% that did make it is always successful, almost, right? Unless that one is super unlucky and this happens. Right, that's probably not gonna happen. It's probably gonna be this scenario up here. The, in, the invasive species, if it invades, it will probably not be dealt with properly. Okay, and that is bad. So let's talk about invasive algae, right? In Hawaii, we have an invasive algae called Gracilaria, right? This one turns out that since it's an algae, it competes with the native algae, so that's already pretty bad, right? It competes with the native algae. But on top of that, can the natives get rid of this guy? They don't even know what this is, right? They've never seen it before. So when this invasive algae that happens to be stronger and faster than the native algae, when we get our native fish to try to eat these guys, the native fish doesn't know what to do. The native fish will continue eating what it, what it already knows to eat. And that creates some positive feedback, which is really bad because the native algae is already dying because it's competing with a stronger invader, right? But now, while this is dying, all the native fish continue preying on this. So the invasive species just like has nothing to check it, right? Just explodes the population. Okay, and what happens when algae grow on coral reefs? They would just smother the reef and compete for sunlight. Okay, so as we can see, invasive species, right, in this case, invasive algae have a really high probability of, you know, smothering the coral reef and, you know, just making so that they can't do photosynthesis anymore. And then the coral reef dies, right? <clears throat> okay, so we could tack this on in invasive species is in anthropogenic impact number two. Okay, so keep in mind, most invaders fail, but when they do make it, they succeed, and it's really, really bad, okay? One common mistake that humans like to do is, you know, whenever there's a species invader, some wise guy is gonna come and suggest, why don't you bring in that organism as a natural predator? 
it will never work because if you bring in the natural predator of you know the invader that's the second invasive species and what happens if that new invasive species comes and prefers the native stuff over the invader now you doubled your problems right and that's what happened in australia right we're trying to get rid of this pest for the sugar cane and so to get rid of that pest we brought in you know something that likes to eat pests frogs right the cane toad was brought into uh, you know australia but then the cane toad ended up preferring eating the native insects instead of the pest so it became a second invasive species and now we can't get rid of it because they're poisonous right and nobody none of the native species will eat it right so that's bad never try to get rid of an invasive species using a second invasive species <clears throat> okay cool so anyways this is the second impact hopefully that makes sense any questions so far okay so since we're on the topic of algae, right, what causes algae to grow, right? Macroalgae. What do they like? Nutrients. They like nutrients. They like hard substrate. Cold water. Okay. In cold water usually, but this time it's warm water. Okay. So uh, they like nutrients. Okay, let's talk about nutrients. Getting nutrients into the ocean, right? Invasive or not invasive algae, no matter what, primary producers and macroalgae like nutrients. And we described nutrients as DLM before, right? So DLM causes these primary producers to grow, whether it be macroalgae or what are these called again? Diatoms, Diatoms right? A protist and phytoplankton causes these guys, guys to grow a lot. What happens if these guys grow a lot because there's a lot of nutrients, right? Well, turns out most of the nutrients arrive in the ocean through rivers, right? And when we pollute the ocean, it's usually by way of agricultural runoff, right? That is probably the worst type of pollution. Everybody thinks pollution is like toxic waste or oil, motor oil or something. Those are bad, but this is actually probably more common, agricultural runoff. And what do we do to our farms? We pump in tons of fertilizer, but most of it gets washed away into the ocean. So who gets the fertilizer? These guys. They get the fertilizer. They grow. We already established that uh, macroalgae is bad for coral, right? But it turns out the phytoplankton is bad for coral too. Because what happens if there's too much phytoplankton in the water? It blocks out the sun. Remember, one of the, the main reasons why water is murky is due to too much phytoplankton. Okay, so if we pollute the water by bringing in nutrients, then it'll cause an algal bloom of, of the phytoplankton. Right? And that's a scenario that we call eutrophication. Right? Eutrophication is a, a state in which there's excess nutrients in the water and then we get algal bloom. So now that eutrophication has occurred, the phytoplankton are blooming, and the water is murky. Okay, water is murky. Corals cannot get their sunlight. That's bad, right? But at the same time, if the macroalgae grows like crazy, then on top of not, the invasive algae not being eaten by the native species, on top of the native species not being eaten by the lack of reef fish, you see the problem that the corals are facing now, right? They're facing algae that is unchecked by reef fish because we overfished reef fish. They are facing uh, competition from invasive algae that grows like crazy and cannot be eradicated. And now they're facing algae that is getting excess nutrients because of our pollution, right? Everything that we do seems to favor the algae, right? We'll learn that some, there are some organisms that are robust and they like human activities and some that are delicate and they do not like human activities, right? And in this case, the algae wins. 
right, and then the coral reefs die. Okay, so if like the algae bloom causes the water to get murky and algae will look like that. Okay, and that's in general bad for the coral. So this is our anthropogenic impact number three, pollution. Keep in mind, there's a bunch of different types of pollution. This is just one of them. We're talking about this because it is in the context of a coral reef, right? A certain type of water pollution. Besides this, what other types of pollution do you guys know of? Plastic. What was that? Plastic. Plastic? Oh, so you're thinking of like litter, right? Litter, physical, uh, like mechanical, or like actual garbage, right? That, that is a type of pollution. What else? Air pollution, yeah, that's a good one, right? Any, any others? Have you guys heard of something like noise pollution? Or mm -hmm. like noise pollution, for example, cars running at night. Don't you realize that the birds need to sleep too, right? But it's hard for them. Uh, light pollution, which is the reason why we can't see stars anymore, right? What were you saying? Oh, doesn't light pollution also like confuse the turtles uh, going back to the ocean? Does it? Yeah. I had no idea, but I'm not surprised if it does do something like um, I know light pollution confuses plants because they go into their photosynthesis cycle even though they need to shut off at night, right? Um, heat pollution, okay, so for example, when you have a power plant next to the ocean and you use the ocean water to cool down the power plant, now you made that area warm and most of the fish probably don't like that, right? <clears throat> and there's all sorts of different types of pollution, right? It's not just like toxic waste or stuff like that. Does anything that's unnatural in the environment counts as pollution, right? So you can even say that in, invasive species is almost like a form of pollution, right? You've polluted the area with all these invasive species, okay? All right, so anyways, yeah, out of all those different types of pollution we mentioned, it's really critical that we talk about probably one of the more controversial types of pollution, the air pollution, right? Air pollution. We are putting greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, right? Namely, carbon dioxide. So let's see how that works, right? Look at this picture of a greenhouse. What's going on? Like, what is the big picture here? You're able to grow plants in the? In what? In the winter. You guys see that? Look, it's, it's snowing outside, but we're growing plants. Why? Because the sun is heating up the ground. When the sun heats up the ground, then the ground begins to radiate out. That's what these bouncing arrows are, right? The ground begins to radiate. Hot things radiate their heat. You stand next to your car after it is running and you feel heat even though you're not touching it, right? So the ground starts to radiate the heat out towards the atmosphere, and normally this heat would escape, but instead it bounces off. What do you think it bounces off? It bounces off the glass, exactly. Glass actually holds the heat in, right? So when the ground bounces the heat off, the heat bounces again off of the glass. It can't get through, right? Glass, turn, turns out, is a really good insulator for infrared radiation, okay? And if we wanna talk about infrared radiation real quick, we just quickly look at the spectrum. Um, this is like all the stuff that we can see. Ultraviolet gives you sunburns, right? And infrared is what we feel as heat. Okay. It's not critical that you know this, but I think it's cool if you know what infrared means. It means heat. So since glass can track infrared radiation, glass traps heat. Okay. One good way that you can actually use this um, to your advantage is if the sun is beating down, you, you actually roll up your windows and it's actually cooler. All right, Because you don't get the radiation from the sun. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so glass traps the infrared radiation and then it makes the inside warm, right? The heat does not escape this greenhouse. And Joe Brian? Is that like infrared like travels and can speed up the process of the body temperature? Um, what does that have to do with this? Remember you're saying like the, the heat being like given off of somebody, like is that like the same thing that you can see it? Like cause you're saying that you like infrared is pretty much heat, right? Mm -hmm. So you can like send, like feel the heat off of somebody? Um, let me just answer the question in a different way. Right. Infrared means heat, right? And sometimes 
if you lose the visible spectrum and you can't see because it's dark, then you might want to see things depending on the heat signature that it gives off, and you would use an infrared goggle. But we're not talking about that. Okay, um, it's the same type of radiation, but the goggles don't. They just convert the heat into a color. It doesn't trap heat or anything. All right, so let's not get too far off topic. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, does this make sense though? All right, the, the point of this discussion is to tell you that when the ground tries to radiate the heat away, it unfortunately, or I mean fortunately, right, in this case, gets trapped by the glass and then it keeps the whole interior warm even though it's cool outside, all right? So if you imagine we had, you know, the whole earth covered in this glass, then we can turn the whole earth into a greenhouse, right? And then we would trap heat and become warmer. Okay, we're not gonna cover the whole earth in glass, but we can cover the whole earth in a certain type of gas that behaves like glass, okay? And that's what we're doing, right? We are putting all sorts of different gases inside our atmosphere. Um, CFCs, right, nitrous oxide, methane, and worst of all, carbon dioxide, because, you know, although carbon dioxide isn't the strongest greenhouse gas, it is the most common. Why is it the most common? Or, well, what's worse than humans and animals? Cars. cars, right, okay? So cars is the number one um, producer of this carbon dioxide greenhouse gas, okay? And it's the one that we think that we have the highest chance of reducing, okay? So carbon dioxide is being given off, but so are these. All these gases, if they go into the atmosphere, they do the same thing as if we covered the earth in glass, right? So the sun heats up the earth, the Earth tries to radiate the heat back into space, but on its way up, what happens? It gets trapped by our atmosphere because the atmosphere has these gases in it now. Okay, so then the Earth becomes warmer, or so the scientists say, right? Okay, so we get global warming. This is a really interesting curve, right? It's really, you guys should know this because it's cool. It zigzags, right? It's a really famous curve called the Mauna Loa curve, right? Named after the mountain, Mauna Loa. You guys know where that is? It's, it is in the middle of the ocean, yeah, but um, it's uh, in Hawaii, right, on the big island. Mauna Loa curve, right, there's a, there's a meteorological station up there, and there's also an observatory and telescope over there, but they measure the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere every year, and so far it looks like it goes up, right? But it doesn't just like go straight up, it actually goes up and then down, up and then down, right, it zigzags. Does anybody have any guesses why it zigzags like that? Seasons. What was that? Seasons. Explain that. So winter and summer. So I mean like, what happened during the winter and what happened during the summer? The cycle of people down. I need more out of you than that. But you're on the right track. Okay, you know what, the, the answer is seasons, but why is it seasons? Like why does it cause it to go up and down? Because some produce more So which one produces more, hot or cold? Hot, because it's right? What do you guys think? Yeah. Goes up during the summer? Yeah. <clears throat> that's, a, that's a pretty good guess. I mean, 50-50 chance, right? The answer is, do you have an answer? It does have to do with plants. It does have to do with plants. So if it does, then what happens? Boy. Okay, so if it, you're saying that if it gets hotter, the carbon dioxide goes down, which is correct, okay? So if it gets warmer, there's more plants and they take up the CO2. So this represents summer in the northern hemisphere going down. And then during winter, when the plants are dying out, the carbon dioxide rises back up again, okay? So it should be in equilibrium, right? The carbon dioxide goes up because all the animals on Earth are breathing out carbon dioxide. During the summer, all of the plants take it all the way back up, right? See, it comes back to the same level. During the winter, all the animals are breathing out carbon dioxide, and then during the summer, all the plants take it all back up. You, can, you see how this doesn't change? It's the same thing. But this is not how it's working right now. How it's working instead is all the animals 
are breathing out carbon dioxide, and then there's cars on top of that, okay? The plants will take up how much? They'll take up the equilibrium amount, this much. This is how much they're designed to take up, right? So they'll take up that much, it'll be like that. And then the next year goes by, all the animals breathe out carbon dioxide. How much? The normal amount, right? But now there's cars on top of that. And the next year, when the plants take it all up again, they only take up the equilibrium amount. And then the animals breathe it out, the equilibrium amount. But then there's pollution on top of that. So every year, it goes up steadily. Okay, and that's what this curve is showing us. Um, from 1960 to 2010, it has gone up from around 320 parts per mil. So parts per mil, that's parts per thousand, right? So 0 0.4% or so, is that right? Might be wrong about that, but hope, hopefully I'm right, I don't know. Um, so 400 parts per, or sorry, 320 parts per thousand back then, and then you go up to 2010, and it's at 400. I remember when I was learning about this, it was around like 390, actually. Okay, so then by now, I wouldn't be surprised if it were already 415 or so, right? We can look it up, we can see what is the carbon dioxide concentration in our atmosphere in 2019, right? Atmospheric carbon dioxide. All right, so it has gone up 11 parts per, oh, it's parts per million. Probably tricky. Okay. Yeah, parts per million, not parts per thousand. It sounds that way. Oh, it does, yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, so by now, after nine years, it has gone up another 11 parts per million. Okay, so it goes up steadily every year because of that, this little thing that I've been drawing, right? If we did not have all this technology pumping out carbon dioxide, it would just go up, down, up, down, and it would just stay relatively constant, okay? So we can take this curve and superimpose it onto this graph right here, and we'll see it's loosely correlated, right? This is sea surface temperatures, and it shows that from 1960 to 2000, it has steadily been increasing, almost aligned with that, almost, right? I mean, it fluctuates a little bit more than that one does, but there is some correlation at Right? It's, it's not like a super strong correlation, but there's some, right? So we believe that these uh, greenhouse gases are indeed causing global warming. Okay, they're making the water slightly, slightly warmer. How much warmer? Well, let's see. Um, if we considered zero as 1960, now it is roughly half a degree warmer. Half a degree warmer doesn't seem like that much, right? Let's see, half a degree C, right? Half a degree C is approximately one degree F, right? So we have increased the ocean roughly one degree F. Okay, Let, let's see, is that bad or good or doesn't make a difference? Well, we are 98.6, 99 degrees. If we go at one degree F, we go to about 100. What is that? That's a fever. You can die in a week after your body increases by only one degree. So that sounds like a bad thing. You're, you're lucky that you're warm-blooded and you're, you can regulate your body temperature. But what about all the fish in the ocean who cannot regulate their body temperature? They are permanently raised one degree F, right? If we raise our temperatures permanently one degree F, we're all in fevers right now, right? So you, you don't think one degree F is a lot, but that's only because you're lucky and you're warm-blooded, right? If you're not warm-blooded, then, well, good luck with that fever, right? One degree is not a joke, right? It actually causes some major physiological changes. Okay? So, like, when I first thought about it, I, I kind of also thought that one degree was not that great because the daily temperature even changes by, like, 20 degrees or so. But... This is, represents a permanent change, right? So 
it's not like the daily temperature goes up by 10 degrees and then at night goes back down 10. No, this is more like everything goes up by one. So the coldest temperature is warmer by one and the warmest temperature is also warmer by one, right? Eventually, you're not gonna be able to adapt to that and then the organism could not do so well, right? Organism adaptation, evolution is really, really slow. It is not fast enough to deal with these changing temperatures, right? So it's usually not very good. Okay, so how does this affect coral, right? If the water gets too warm, the corals that are, cannot regulate their body temperature will get stressed out and eject their zooxanthellae. Their zooxanthellae will leave their polyps. So uh, obviously that's bad. Uh, what does that mean the coral can't do anymore? Photosynthesis. Can't do photosynthesis, can't get food, right? Corals will starve to death when it gets too warm, right? So at the same time, the zooxanthellae inside of their bodies are also not only providing them with food, but it also provides a color because the zooxanthellae have all the pigments inside, right? Chlorophyll, fucoxanthin, uh, phycobilins, right? Has all those pigments inside. So if you eject all your zooxanthellae, then you also lose your color. So what color does coral become when they lose their color? They become white, okay? This is a phenomenon known as coral bleaching, and it is caused when the water gets too warm. Okay, so global warming, right? How, how does it affect corals? It makes them bleach, right? So the corals can survive for a little bit like this, but too long and they will starve to death, right? By the time they starve, then the coral will die. If the coral dies, then they will no longer maintain their skeleton. The water will erode their skeleton and no more reef, right? No more reef means no more what? Why not? No more shelter, right? The fish like the reef because of the shelter. But if the corals cannot maintain the skeleton and it all crumbles, then there's no more shelter and the fish will leave as well, right? Okay, so coral bleaching has caused this. Okay, so that sounds pretty bad already, right? This is actual coral bleaching in action taken a few years apart. Um, however, there is more to the air pollution than just global warming. What was that gas called again that we put in the atmosphere? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, right? The green, it's a very, very prominent greenhouse gas. Mm -hmm. Turns out that carbon dioxide mixes with water, reacts and turns into carbonic acid, okay? So not only is the carbon dioxide trapping heat and making it warmer, it's also dissolving in the ocean, making it more acidic. So now the ocean is slightly more acidic. Not, it's not like acid or anything. Right? But it's slightly more acidic than before. Remember, even though it's not an acid, minute changes still make a big deal. All right. So what happens when it becomes acidic? Right. Well, let me show you an example. Right. Um, let's watch this clip I have. All right. This clip is someone putting vinegar, which is an acid, and calcite together. Calcite is a mineral. What do you think it's made out of? Calcium carbonate. Exactly. Right? So what happens when you put those together? Okay, so here's the calcite, calcium carbonate. Makes sense that it's white, right? And he's putting the vinegar inside. Okay, so let's watch, what happens? You guys should be able to see it by now. What's happening to it? It's dissolving, you see the bubbles? All those little bubbles come out. Uh, calcium carbonate dissolves in acid. All right. So if you make the ocean slightly more acidic, you'll see that calcium carbonate doesn't fare so well in the ocean anymore. Right? It's too bad that most of the animals in the ocean are made out of calcium carbonate. Right? So basically what I'm trying to say is every calcareous organism is going to be affected by this. Ocean acidification. Right? So can you guys name some? What might be affected by it? Mollusca, right? All moss build their seashells out of calcium carbonate. Who else? Sponges, which sponge? Calcarea. Calcarea, exactly. And the corals, right? Because corals are made out of calcium carbonate. Anything that's made of calcium carbonate will be affected, right? So just a quick disclaimer. I don't want to say that the ocean becomes so acidic that it literally dissolves it. It just makes it harder to build its shell. And 
It's because like every time it tries to build its shell, a little bit gets dissolved. So it has to expend more energy. And whenever you cause something to expend more energy, then it may starve, right? Because all the energy that it needs comes from its food, right? <clears throat> okay, so it makes it very difficult to make its shell and keep in mind everything that's calcareous is affected. Yeah, Allison? Wait, but isn't it also like, um, like the reason why the coral is all white also is like just because of the winds that the pollen is because I remember uh, in bio class our professor showed us a video and supposedly like the winds from uh, the seas or something like brings over pollen and like all the dust that's from over there and it lands into the ocean so that makes it worse too. Uh, it does. It does make it worse, but it's not because of. Um, ocean acidification or coral bleaching. So, um, dust, yeah, we can actually talk about that a little. It's kind of related, right? Um, by the way, these are the organisms that get affected. So real quick, um, corals, crustaceans, like arthropods, mollusca, this is, what is this? You guys know what that is? That's an injury. Uh No, it's not, it's not an animal either. It's coralline algae, yeah, right. it's type of rhodophyta. Um, this is calcarea, type of sponge, stromatolites, what's this? Uh, it's not a diatom. Diatoms are delicious. Yeah, coccolithophores. And this was the other protist. And this one? This was started with an F. Yeah, it's that one. Foraminifera. Okay, yeah, so these guys get affected negatively by ocean acidification when carbon dioxide is all in water. So to answer Alex's question about dust, um, yeah, there's a lot of dust that is blown into the ocean by the wind. All right, and that is another form of pollution, sort of, right? Actually, um, the sea animals, or not the animals, the marine organisms, the plankton, benefit from the dust because, remember, the open ocean is oligotrophic, so the dust usually brings in iron, okay? That's, I, I think that's the thing that we're looking for here. Iron is brought in by the dust, and with that iron, the, di the diatoms, they, they grow rapidly, and they create an algal bloom, all right? And the algal bloom, as we have discussed earlier, how does that affect corals? Or maybe, wait, can you figure it out? How does the algal bloom affect coral? Just takes all the nutrients that the corals will take. The coral don't need nutrients, remember? Or the, it doesn't let them do the photosynthesis. Why not? Because then they take, they, they kind of build like a little wall, so they can't get sunlight. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'll accept that. So like, when you get an algal bloom, remember phytoplankton is the number one reason why water is murky, right? And then it makes the water murky and then it, the sun can't shine through and then the corals don't get their sunlight to do photosynthesis. Okay, so um, the dust is kind of a problem. Yeah, it creates those algal blooms, okay? <clears throat> All right, so does this sound okay? Right, so the whole idea about air pollution, the carbon dioxide, does two things. One is it traps the, the sunlight, sorry, it traps the heat radiation and it makes it warmer. And the second thing is it dissolves in water to become carbonic acid. Okay, and then we get ocean acidification. Right, any questions about this? So anthropogenic effect number four, or sorry, I guess, I guess this is just an example. Sorry. The example of ocean acidification is 30 years later, we see the corals dying, and when the coral dies, it no longer maintains its skeleton, and we lose the structure that we used to have, and eventually this will completely dissolve, and the fish will leave because there's no more reef. Okay. All right, so anthropogenic effect number four. Oh, man, I still didn't write it yet. Uh, it'll come back in a couple slides, I promise. Okay. So, continuing on with the acidic warm ocean, right? Now the ocean is warmer and more acidic. Like I said before, there are certain hardier organisms that like human activity, right? And there's other ones that do not like the delicate ones. So the corals clearly do not enjoy human activities, but jellyfish seem to be doing fine, right? Jellyfish, they like the human activities because when the water becomes warmer, more acidic, then it begins to approximate a primordial ocean, like a prehistoric dinosaur time ocean. Okay, and the prehistoric dinosaur time ocean had a lot of jellyfish, as 
that time. So we predict that when our ocean becomes warmer and more acidic, then we'll get more of the animals that thrive during the dinosaur times. So like jellyfish, okay. So hardy organisms like that will begin to you know, take over and then we'll go into a scenario like this. It's called the jellyfish ocean. There's a lot of algae and there's a lot of jellyfish all over the place. And that's because these are the ones that do very well when it's warm and acidic. And so, from before, we have a coral reef, right? And we lose the coral reef, and then now instead we have a new dominant organism, the jellyfish. What is the jellyfish ocean an example of? It's called a regime shift, okay? So this is another example of regime shift because we go from coral reef with a bunch of fish to now algae with a bunch of jellyfish. Okay, so now um, we can talk about what do the coral reefs do then? What can they do? Right? What can the coral reefs and all the reef fish do if it becomes too warm and acidic for them? Migrate, right? Yes, right, they, they begin to migrate. Where do they migrate to? Well, all the ones in the tropics right now, they like their warm water. If that place becomes too hot, they will look for somewhere cooler that is the same temperature as before. Right? So where can they go that's cooler? They can start going towards the poles, right? Where it's cooler. So take a look at this diagram right over here. The yellow oval represents where all the tropical organisms currently live. And between the yellow and the green represent where all the temperate organisms live. Okay, so just a quick uh, tidbit on what I'm trying to say, temperature regions. We have tropical, subtropical, temperate, and polar. Uh, for us, our climate is temperate. Okay, for Hawaii, it is tropical. Okay, all right. So, tropical organisms live here. They like how warm it is, and temperate organisms like it here. They like how mild it is. Okay, and polar organisms live here. They like how cold it is. Okay. If global warming occurs, the whole Earth warms at the same time. The whole warm earth warms at the same time, so this part becomes a couple of degrees warmer, this part becomes a couple of degrees warmer, and this part becomes a couple of degrees warmer. So what ends up happening? The tropical region becomes too hot. The temperature region, no, sorry, the temperate region becomes so warm that it is now the same temperature as the old tropical region. Does that make sense? All right, so if we want to put some numbers into this to try to help us understand this, let's just pretend that the tropical region is like 30 degrees, okay? And the temperate region is 25 degrees C, okay? So this is temperate and this is tropical. A few years later, hundreds of years later with the global warming, the whole Earth increases by 5 degrees C, all right? Then the temperate region is now 30 degrees C, and the tropical region is 35. Do we see what happened here? All the tropical creatures from before are going to try to go to the new temperate region because it's the same temperature as before, right? Does that make sense? You get that? Yeah, Allison. But then how do they know like, where, where to go? Do they just naturally... They don't know. They just try both ways, and half of them die, and half of them don't. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's, that's usually how it goes, right? It's, it's kind of random. Um, things move like kind of with the ocean currents. And so if they have a gyre that takes them the right way, then good, right? But they could also have a gyre that takes them the wrong way, and then they die, right? If they can swim by themselves, then half of them will swim the wrong way, and half of them will swim the right way. Unless they're like birds with their little magnetic compass thing, and they might actually know which way to go, right? So like birds fly south during the winter because they know it's warmer, but that's actually a misconception. That's only in America, where bias. Actually, birds in South America fly north, right, to get to the tropics. <clears throat> okay, so some of them they know, other ones they don't know, and other ones they just rely on the currents. All right, so the point is, these tropical ones will try to go here because this place will approximate the same temperature as what they're used to from before. 
right? So then we'll get a, uh, sorry, a phenomenon known as range expansion. So do you guys notice how the lines got wider, right? So the new tropical range is from here to here now, but not in the middle because this part is too hot, right? They moved up because this part is now warm enough for the tropical, right? And then you see the green line? The green line moved up too because this part is now is now warm enough to be the same temperature as they're used to. Right? So we get a little tropical range expansion. Okay? That is if they can move, right? If you're sessile, then tough luck. Right? Thankfully, the sessile organisms used have larvae that can flow in the ocean currents, um, but th that comes with its own set of challenges. Right? So this is just one possibility that scientists believe will happen we will see a lot of organisms starting to migrate towards the poles. Okay, so now here's the question. What are the polar organisms gonna do? Where are they gonna go? They're gonna go extinct, yes. They have nowhere colder to flee to, right? The polar organisms will go extinct, right? And that means up north we have polar bears, south we have penguins, they will have nowhere to go. Right. So unfortunately for the polar organisms, they are at the greatest risk for global warming. Right. Because they, they have no like refuge, right? They're just gone. <clears throat> okay. So anyways, yeah, this is anthropogenic impact number four, right? Climate change. Okay, and remember climate change entails two things global warming, ocean acidification. Okay, so let's tack that on to our list here. impact number four, climate change, right? Climate change involves a greenhouse gas, heats up the atmosphere, causes coral bleaching, or the greenhouse gas dissolves in the ocean and it makes it more acidic and now calcareous organisms struggle. <clears throat> okay, so by now, we have gone over four. Do you guys remember how many there were total? Five, right? So we're ready to talk about the final anthropogenic impact, right? The final anthropogenic impact has to do with, sorry, um, you can check that later, has to do with this, right? This is an atoll. You guys remember what an atoll is? What's an atoll? It's made out of Coral. corals. Yeah, exactly. So remember, there used to be a volcanic island in here, but what happened to it? It sank, right? And then leaving a ring-shaped island. Okay, so here's a atoll, here's a lagoon in the middle, Okay, this is in the Pacific Islands, and it's called Bikini, right? Bikini Atoll is a really famous island because it had a native population of humans living on here, but then in the, during the Cold War, everybody was evicted forcefully because, yeah, we wanted to bomb it, right? So what happened to Bikini Atoll shortly after this? Well, we'll have to watch this to figure it out. Oh yeah, it's also better if we can hear the sound, so. Oh, uh, Joe Brown, can you hit the lights? It makes it more ominous that way. So what do we do to it, right? We destroyed that area, okay? We destroyed it because there's some very important tests that we can do, right? We, we wanna see how does, what happens directly after a glass to an ecosystem, right? What happens to um, a marine ecosystem when we bomb it because there's a lot of water? And also, how long does it take for the ecosystem to recover, right? All of those are interesting questions that we can ask. But the point is, we just went out and destroyed an ecosystem right there. Right, we destroyed the habitat, and that is the last type of anthropogenic influence that we're going to talk about. Right, straight up habitat destruction. Right, habitat destruction is one of the most like harmful threats to biodiversity, and it's basically when we do these two main things. Right, atomic bomb test is one thing, 
but it turns out the worst culprit of habitat destruction is actually land development, which is what everybody here is guilty of, right? Because everybody here lives in a city, and if we make a city, that implies that we have dredged the area and cleared out all the trees, right, to cover it with silicon and concrete instead, right? <clears throat> so development of land and also slash and burn agriculture are two of the major forms of habitat destruction. And when you destroy the habitat, then you will get rid of all the organisms that depend on the habitat, right? So we can write this out as number five, right? Okay, good old straight up habitat destruction. Okay, so at this point, I want you guys to take these five, right? And I want you guys to rank them in terms of uh, the least damaging to the worst damaging. Or I mean, the worst damaging to the least damaging, right? From one through five, right? I want you guys to take a couple minutes to think it through, and then we'll see what you guys come up with. Yeah, uh, no, uh, one being the worst and five being the least worst. So this is how we're going to do this. I'm going to go over each one, and then you guys tell me if you thought that it was the worst or not. Okay? So overfishing. Nobody? Okay. Invasive species? Right? How about pollution? Climate change? Habitat destruction. The rest of you guys win, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so I guess I kind of screwed up. I kind of told you what it was, right? What was it? Yeah. It was habitat destruction, just because I said so, right? Um, habitat destruction was the worst. Okay, I screwed up there. But let me tell you which one is actually the worst, right? Um, out of all of these, um, the least or the worst damaging is habitat destruction, right? So we'll put that one as number one. Okay, and it's not because of bombs, it's just because of development, right? And it was the major one. Number two is this one right here, okay? Um, we can reword this as over harvest because we're not just talking about the ocean here, we're also talking about land resources such as trees and land animals as well, right? So over harvest is the second most damaging. Okay, overharvest. <clears throat> Why is overharvest so damaging? Well, we didn't really talk too much about fishing and stuff, but I do want to mention one thing. It is really easy to overfish the ocean because most of the life in the ocean lives on the continental shelf. Alright, and that is like less than 1% of the entire surface area of the, the ocean. So all the animals are living on the continental shelf, which is the very fringe, right? So if here's like a continent, the continental shelf is only about 20 to 50 miles off of it, right? And so this whole part of the ocean, there's nothing here, right? All the animals are living right here, okay? So if you want to 
fish out the whole ocean, all you have to do is just go there and you got already 90% of the whole ocean. Tiny little area. Second of all, this is the easiest. Why is it the easiest? Because we live here. It's hard to get out here. It's easy to go here. Close, it's easy access, and the water here is shallower than there. So how long does your net have to be? Not as long, right? Secondly, destructive fishing practices such as trawling is really, really effective at cleaning up the entire seafloor. So um, not only does it break up the fish, it also does habitat destruction at the same time. So those ecosystems take a long time to recover, right? So overharvest is actually pretty strong, right? Okay, so number three, the third worst one is pollution. Okay, that's considered to be the third. Um, it's probably because it's very widespread and it's not like, I wanna call it like very picky or specific, all right? Something that is picky and specific is invasive species, right? Invasive species is kind of like, it really relies on like certain conditions matching up perfectly in order to work. So in order for a species to be successfully invasive, it's actually very difficult. It's just that when it finally happens, it's really destructive, right? So that's number four. And actually it turns out currently in this day and age, climate change is the least destructive out of these. Not to say it's the weakest one, it's more so that we're not at, yet at the point in which it has become a problem, right? Maybe 200 years from now, right? We will get something called runaway greenhouse effect. In that case, it'll quickly accelerate and be worse than most of these, right? But at least right now, we're still in the early stages in what scientists believe is still reversible. I don't, know. I don't think we can reverse it. But um, right now, the stage is still pretty early and it's not causing too many effects so far. Right? And all the other ones are much more effective at destroying the ecosystems as that one. Okay? Yeah, Allison? But what about, okay, Mary, we get rid of like all the overfishing, the pollution, the climate change that has yet to reach that point. Yeah. Will there ever be a, a chance that we can bring back the coral to the way it was, or is it just gone at this point? Oh, so you mean like if we halted all of our destructive practices. Yeah, like if we were to just completely like, okay, we messed up, like this is the time to change it, like right now. Yeah. Are we too far in the point for the coral reefs to be put back? Uh, I don't think so. No, I think it can recover. Um, it won't recover exactly the same because many things have already gone extinct, yeah. but it'll recover to a state that's gonna be okay. Yeah, it is possible. Because like I said, since right now it has not reached that stage yet, mm -hmm. then Theoretically, it's at a stage where it's not that much damage has been created. If there's not much damage, then there's not much to fix either. So we can fix it, right? But the question is, are we willing to fix it? And yeah. that requires giving up a lot of our luxuries, which is not gonna happen. <clears throat> okay, so um, that's gonna be the end of this lecture, I believe. So uh, hopefully you guys learned a lot. Um, this was our final lecture on coral reefs. Coral reefs, we talked a little bit at the, about in the beginning, but for the majority of lectures, we use reefs as like the guinea pig in our like, little uh, dis, uh, discussion on the anthropogenic impacts, okay? So make sure we got all those impacts down, and at the same time, we also know how coral reefs work, right? Corals are a type of calcareous cnidarian that builds a reef that other fish like to live on, and they uh, are very susceptible to a lot of things because one, they do photosynthesis, so algae, which is stronger, competes with them. And two, uh, they made a calcium carbonate, so the ocean acidification affects them. And then also, they bleach themselves during global warming. Right. Okay, so any questions on coral reefs? Yeah, why? Acid, uh, ocean acidification, that under uh, climate change or pollution? Uh, ocean acidification is under climate change. Anybody else? You all good? You all satisfied? Okay, you have exactly. to know the, the order that you gave us for the... Oh, this order? Um, yeah, sure, why not? Yeah, I mean like, I don't, this is not like hard or anything. Okay. So, so, but, yeah. okay. Everybody good? Okay, cool. So anyways, yeah, I, I really enjoyed um, all of our lectures.
So hopefully you guys did all right and learned a lot. We will see how well you guys do on the test next week. Okay? All right, cool. So make sure you stick around. Uh, we'll have a 10-minute break, but then there's stuff that we're going to do afterward as well.